pray first. Father, we just really thank you for your word to us. Thank you that we have access to your word. Thank you that by your spirit you bring it to life for each of us. And pray this morning that your Holy Spirit be at work in all our hearts, that we would hear what you want to say to us. Amen. Now, you might be wondering if you're having a bit of a deja vu or a senior moment uh, this morning, because you might have heard this reading just very recently here at Christchurch. But don't worry, because just like the BBC, God does do repeats. Uh, but the wonderful thing about God's Word is that it's new every morning, and it's living and active. And you can always find something else that God wants to say to you, even through the most familiar passages. But first of all, just sit back and relax and watch this little bit of fun. And just to set the scene, uh, their friend has gone missing. Thank you. You, sir. See? What's your name? There's obviously a lot of confusion about the person's identity and it doesn't really seem to be getting sorted. And I quite like to call this talk, What's in a Name? Uh, But looking especially at verse 63 of our reading where Zachariah writes, his name is John. You might know from earlier verses of Luke that Elizabeth and Zachariah were in their later years and had not been able to have any children. But at perhaps the most sacred moment of Zachariah's life as a priest, when he was called to serve in a very special way in the temple, God tells him that they are to have a son and are to name him John. Now today, different cultures have different traditions when it comes to naming a new baby. In some cultures, it's down to the grandparents who will pray and consider what would be a suitable name. And then when they are ready, and it may be some days or even weeks after the birth, they'll tell the child's parents what they've decided, and there'll be a big naming ceremony. I have an Indian colleague who's expecting her first baby, and I asked her how they will decide on their child's name. Uh, For them, there'll be a particular letter of the alphabet that's relevant at the time of the baby's birth, and they will choose a name beginning with that letter. In the British culture, we normally just pick what we want, um, perhaps choosing a family name that others in the family have had. So my middle name's Elizabeth, our daughter Katie's middle name is Elizabeth, our granddaughter Alice's name is Elizabeth. I'm not sure what Brendan's parents, I don't think they thought too deeply about his name, because he's named after an Irish saint. But if you look it up in a book, one of these naming books, it can mean bog man or stinking hair. He says he's washed it this morning. (laughs) So sometimes people choose the name of somebody they admire, or a celebrity, or a wine, or even a football team. And we don't really have traditions here in the same way. But in the Jewish culture, it's traditional to choose either the name of the child's father or another close relative. So it's with some surprise that those present at the naming of Elizabeth and Zacharias, Zachariah's new son heard Elizabeth say with some force that his name was to be John, the name specifically given by God to the child. Why John? Well, in Hebrew, this means God is gracious, and God had certainly been gracious to Zachariah and Elizabeth in granting them a child in their old age. 
But in addition, God gave this name to point to what was to come, the graciousness of God in sending Jesus to save us from our sins and to offer us eternal life with him, which was the very message that John would proclaim. So in many ways, our whole identity is wrapped up in our name. It's on our passports, perhaps our most important form of ID. If you've had to apply for a DBS to work with children or vulnerable adults here, you'll know that you have to produce documents with your name on. And in addition, we sort of become our name, don't we? If I suddenly asked you to start calling me Susan, you'd find it difficult initially, because in your mind, I would still be Helen, and all that that meant to you, sort of good or bad. So John's name had real meaning, but more than that, it defined him as someone who God had called for a specific purpose. God knew him from the beginning and had a very special plan for his life. And John would have known all about this from a very early age. Stories about his father's encounter with God in the temple and his naming would have been passed down through the family, and he would have been very aware of this. Just listen to what he says as his, as his identity is questioned by the Pharisees. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptise if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptise with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. So John was very clear about who he was and what he had been called to do. See, his identity was defined by God, not by his family or his disciples or the religious leaders. And today we might say that his identity was found in Christ. So how did this knowledge affect how John behaved? Well, he was certainly a strange one. He definitely didn't follow the ways of those around him. This is what Matthew says. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. There's that verse again. And it goes on, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the river Jordan. Just listen to what one com commentator says about him. The most puzzling aspect of John's ministry was that he had any audience at all. What was it that compelled residents of Jerusalem to leave the comfort of home, to venture miles into the Judean desert to hear John? These people poured out in multitudes, miles into the wilderness, to listen to John preach. It would not be stretching the truth to say that John's sermons were more scorching than the blistering Judean sun. And let us remember that John is never reported to have performed so much as one miracle. And even Herod himself was strangely attracted to his preaching. John didn't follow the latest fashion trends or the latest dietary advice, and he spent his time way out in the desert preaching a very uncomfortable and uncompromising message. You are sinful and you need to repent. And later in his life, he gave a very unpopular message to Herod, who had married his brother's wife, Herodias, which was against the law. And this resulted in John's execution with his head being presented on the plate. How did he manage to say such unpopular things? He was certainly a courageous man, but most of all, he knew his life was wrapped up in Christ. 
He knew who he was and that what he was going to do had been ordained by God before he was even born. Remember, he leapt in his mother's womb when Mary, pregnant with Jesus, came to visit his mother, Elizabeth. Even the spirit of the unborn John knew Jesus, and he retained his identity to the end of his life. He fulfilled all that God had created him to be, even though it meant coming up against the religious leaders, courting unpopularity, and ultimately suffering by being imprisoned and executed. Now, it may be that your name was not given directly by God, as John's was, but nevertheless, he knows it. He created you with a unique personality and character and for a unique purpose. A very familiar psalm to many of you says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvellous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. He gave you your identity. And when you became a Christian, you became a part, part of God's family and took on the family identity of a son or daughter of God. And Galatians 3 says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. And when you invite Jesus into your life, he lives in you by his spirit, and your identity is then found in Christ. In Acts 17, verse 28, Paul, when he's speaking to the people of Athens, he says, For in him... That is Christ. We live and move and have our being. That's our identity. So the question for us today is, do we find our identity in Christ or in something else? Do we find our value in our relationship with our Heavenly Father or in someone else? Do we think of ourselves primarily as Helen, dearly loved daughter of God, or Glynn, dearly loved son of God, or Nigel, dearly loved son of God, or Neo, dearly loved daughter of God? Or do we give ourselves a label that defines us? Administrator, teacher, accountant, I'm a carer, a husband, mother, unemployed, retired, single. Or perhaps we've allowed other people to label us. Old, disabled, stupid, useless, ugly, or even clever or perfect. Any of these might be true, but they should not be what define us. To God, we are a marvellous piece of work. He sees our potential, and he has plans for us. Now, you might say, as I might, that it looks like he made some mistakes along the way when he created me, as I'm a little short of marvellous. But no, God doesn't make mistakes. The wrinkles in our character or personality are there because sin came into the world and in general we choose to go our own way. We cannot say that because I'm a bad-tempered so-and-so, that's okay because that's the way God made me. It's part of my identity. When we become a Christian, we become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And that new creation is one which is becoming more like Jesus every day. So it's no excuse to say, perhaps, when our faults are pointed out, that that's how God made me. And Paul says in Romans 6, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? So we need to work at becoming more like Jesus, being transformed by the Holy Spirit and no longer conforming to the pattern of this world. The truth is, though, that life often gets in the way of this process and we do take on a false identity, often formed by our own desires or the pressures of the world or what others think of us. Let's just look at some of the ways that people find their identity today. 
I'll give you some examples, but you can probably think of others. And perhaps later today you can begin to think about whether any of these apply to you or to consider whether you find your identity in something or someone other than Jesus. So what do you do for a job or career? Does your job give you status that might begin to be more important to you than serving God or other people? Are you quick to tell people about what you do rather than how, who you are? How much you earn? Do you earn more or less than your friends? And does it matter to you or to them? What you look like, now this is a big one today. Are your teeth white enough for you to be acceptable? Will people comment if you're not wearing the latest Victoria or David Beckham fashions? Do you have to go to extreme lengths to keep yourself looking young? For some, that's absolutely vital to their sense of self-worth. And a key one for young people today, how many friends or likes they have on Facebook or other social media. And sadly, this has caused so much distress to many young people today. Only this week, there's a story in the paper about a 10-year-old girl who's on suicide watch because an online survey declared her ugly. That's now how she sees herself, rather than the beautiful child that God created. But perhaps a bit closer to home, does your position or role in the church or community take over the person who God created you to be? Are you finding your worth in how many rotors you're on or how busy you are serving God? And not that I'm suggesting that anybody packs anything up at the moment. But if any of these things are more important to you than Jesus, then it's a sign that you are finding your identity in them. And one of the ways to test this is to, is to consider how you would feel if they were suddenly taken away. If you lost your job, if you lost your looks, if you lost your position in church. Just take some time, maybe later, to imagine this happening. We live in a society that almost forces us to take on a new and false identity. The pressures on many of us, and especially on our young people, to be what others want us to be are enormous, creating all sorts of problems from anxiety and depression to bankruptcy to just not being fulfilled in who we were meant to be. If we are not finding our identity in Christ, then the ch chances are that we are living a lie, striving to be someone other than the person God created. Jesus came into the world so that we can have freedom, freedom from sin and death, yes, but also freedom to live as the person God made us to be. In Galatians 5.1 it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I just want to give a bit of a personal testimony here. A good number of years ago now, I had what is sometimes described as a kairos moment. One of those light bulb moments, one of those moments in time when the Holy Spirit does something that changes everything. I was just reading the blurb connected with one of the world's most respected personality tests, and I came across a description of a personality type which described my personality very closely. I'm not quite sure what happened, and I don't recommend you try to find your identity through one of these tests, but God used it to show me that he had created me and was pleased with what he had done, and that it was absolutely okay to be me. I was who he wanted me to be. Now for me it had a profound effect. It gave me a sense of freedom, the sort that only Jesus can give. And not only that, it had a knock-on effect that helped me to understand our daughters and so become a better parent. In short, I had discovered my identity in Christ and I can honestly say it was one of the most important events in my Christian life. You see, knowing who we are in Christ helps us to serve him better by giving us confidence in the plans he has for us and courage, and John the Baptist needed loads of that, to carry them out. And as parents and grandparents, we have a vital role in helping our children and our grandchildren, and that includes the children in our church family, 
to grow into the person they were created to be, not who the world wants them to be. But for each of us, it's an ongoing process. The world crowds in on us, doesn't it? Badgering us to take on that false identity. How do we protect our God-given identity or maybe find it for the first time? Reading God's word, studying it in our small groups and listening in church is always good and it's vital. And we can hear that God created us and loves us. But quite honestly, I believe this is the work of the Holy Spirit. If you are not sure that you are carrying the correct ID, you're not sure that you're a child of God, or perhaps you've allowed something else to take the place of God in being the prime source of your identity, then I'd encourage you to pray, or perhaps ask someone to pray for you, asking God by his Holy Spirit to give you a glimpse of the real you, the man or the woman that God created, loves and knows by name. That's not always an easy path. You might have to hand over your false ID, giving up something that you hold dear so that Jesus becomes the source of your self-worth. But it's absolutely worth it. To find that freedom in Christ, as John the Baptist did, is life-changing and it's life-enhancing. I just want to finish uh, by playing a short song for you to listen to.